Come on in. We need to uh, start talking about our next uh, attempt at apologetics. And the uh, thinker that I want to talk about first, his name is Schleiermacher. I'll put this overhead up. Obviously a German name. means veil maker. Veil, V-E-I-L, veil maker. Uh, born at the uh, second half of the 18th century, died first half of the 19th century. Um, I've described him as a religious anti-Christian. He professed Christianity. But the apologetics enterprise is getting so far afield at this point that it's actually undermining Christianity rather than defending it. Uh, he's the father of theological liberalism. Um, if you read any book by J. Gresham Machen, read Christianity and Liberalism. He talks about liberalism and how it's a different religion from what Christianity is. Uh, Schleiermacher's central book is called On Religion, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. And what he does, his approach is this. He says, it has been a mistake to think that Christianity is an intellectual affair at all. It is not something to do with the mind or knowledge or truth. It has something to do with religious feelings and emotions. And he takes that step because of a man named Immanuel Kant, K-A-N-T, Kant. He was a German philosopher who wrote at the end of the 18th century and Kant argued that religion, at best, was a matter of, not of science, not of intellectual understanding, uh, but of feelings and emotions. And he was very much influenced by Kant. Uh, he did it for another reason as well. He saw science and history as growing threats to Christianity. Uh, particularly research, archaeological research, historical research. He says if we want to have a stable belief, a stable Christianity, it can't be subject to continual change uh, due to new findings in history or new findings in some other discipline. We've got to put Christianity itself beyond those things and we have to ground it in something other than research. And what we do is we ground Christianity in emotions and feelings um, and in subjective experience. I've given a few quotes that give a flavor of what Schleiermacher thought. Feelings are exclusively the elements of religion and none is excluded. No feeling is excluded. He focused on one feeling. He called it a feeling of absolute dependence. He said a feeling of absolute dependence. And if you analyze that feeling, he said, you have to come up with a belief in God. Because to be absolutely dependent requires a creator and a creature. And he says, we all have this feeling of absolute dependence, and that's the basis for our belief in God this feeling that we have. Uh, he says, ideas and principles are all foreign to religion. He's not going to present an intellectual argument, whether it's rationalist or empiricist or scripturalist, whatever. He says, I'm not going to do it. Ideas and principles are foreign to religion. Religion knows nothing of deducing. That is, he's repudiating the first chapter of the Westminster Confession, which says that uh, we can deduce by good and necessary consequence from Scripture. He says, religion knows nothing of deducing. And finally, another quote, it matters not what conceptions a man adheres to, he can still be pious. It doesn't matter what his ideas or his beliefs are, so long as he has the proper feelings. He can still be pious. Um, perhaps a more familiar way uh, that you've heard this is it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. 
That's a popular way of stating what Schleiermacher was talking about. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. You can still be pious. Piety consists in having the right emotional response, in having the right feeling, uh, in feeling the proper things, whatever the proper things are. And religion is a matter of those feelings. You don't start with scripture. You don't start with sense experience. You start with religious experience. You don't start with logic, to be sure. You start with religious experience. Uh, people today, um, and in the 19th century, the late 19th century, argued very similarly to this. They say, well, uh, every man has certain uh, feelings, certain emotions. He feels awe at certain times. Uh, he feels wonder at certain times. And those feelings uh, are religious feelings. And they have to be explained uh, by some sort of object. Now, he may feel awe, as uh, many people have done, by, by looking at the sun or something. And the sun becomes an object of worship. He may feel wonder by admiring design in nature. And the natural object becomes an object of worship. That's how idolatry begins, with those feelings. But Schleiermacher says it's Christianity when he's talking about religion here. Notice how they use the generic word religion uh, rather than Christianity uh, is a matter of feelings. Uh, let me give a few more quotes uh, from Schleiermacher. He says, I ask, therefore, that you turn from everything usually um, called religion and fix your regard on the inward emotions and dispositions as all utterances and acts of inspired men direct. He says, all the inspired men say, turn your attention inside. Turn your attention to your inward dispositions and your inward emotions. Now, Schleiermacher has been very influential in the 20th century. He was not only influential in the 19th century, but you can see, perhaps, how he has shaped Christianity uh, in the United States in the 20th century. We're told to concentrate on what's inside of us. Now, we're told, if they want to use more pious language in some circles, uh, more biblical language, they'll say, uh, Christ in you is the basis of your salvation. Now this is the old doctrine of the Roman Church. You concentrate on what's inside of you, your subjective state, your subjective experiences. The Reformation began when Luther gave up on looking inside himself because he couldn't find the righteousness inside himself that would warrant his justification. And then when reading Romans and Galatians, it dawned on him that the righteousness of God doesn't refer to what's inside of him, but to the life and death of Jesus Christ. And our righteousness is in heaven, completely outside of us, completely objective, has nothing to do with what's inside of us. But in the 20th century, under the influence of Schleiermacher and his followers, uh, religion, in many churches, uh, has come to mean a concentration on your subjective uh, state, your feelings and your emotions and your experiences. Uh, let me give a couple more quotes uh, from Schleiermacher here. Um, <clears throat> he handles the, the issue of the Inquisition. Uh, the persecution during the Middle Ages by the Catholic Church of, of Christians and Jews uh, and other non-Catholics, uh, the issue of the Crusades. He says, don't blame this on religion. Blame it on those who have created dogmas, ideas, doctrines. And those things have nothing to do with true religion. He says, don't blame this on true religion says you should blame it on those who have created these doctrines. 
his exact words are, How unjustly, therefore, do you reproach religion with loving persecution, with being malignant, with overturning society, and making blood flow like water? Blame those who corrupt religion, who flood it with an army of formulas and definitions and seek to cast it into the fetters of a so-called system. Uh, if you read the uh, catechism, the Westminster Shorter or the Westminster Larger Catechism, you'll see that a good part of the catechism consists of definition. What is God? Followed by a definition. What is sin? Followed by a definition. And it goes through like that and defines carefully what the terms mean. That is Christianity. But Schleiermacher says this has nothing to do with true religion. True religion consists only of feelings, of emotions, of dispositions, and has nothing to do with doctrines or ideas or anything intellectual. Ideas and principles are all foreign to religion. Now what he had hoped to achieve by this is he's by placing, uh, what shall we say, religion uh, off limits to things intellectual, making it, a, making it uh, a matter of the emotions. He, he's hoping to make it immune from further criticism. But in his attempt to make uh, true religion immune from criticism from historians, from scientists, from philosophers, he has undermined uh, Christianity altogether. He has changed it into something that it is not. That's the argument of Machen's book. A Machen wrote in the 20th century. And he mentions Schleiermacher in the book. He says he's one of the uh, gentlemen who has started all this nonsense in the churches about emotions and feelings and dispositions. And Machen says that Christianity is a matter of the mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Love God with your mind, the first and great commandment. It doesn't say love God with your emotions. It says love God with your mind. And Christianity is not something that is a matter of the emotions as Schleiermacher made it out to be. Uh, it becomes a completely anti-intellectual attitude uh, when Schleiermacher is done with it. Now, his influence was felt immediately in Germany in the 19th century. Uh, German churches became very liberal in the 19th century. Uh, Germany was the, um, what shall we say, the fountainhead of the poison. Uh, American uh, ministers went to Germany to be educated, and they imbibed this liberal uh, theology uh, in the German universities and brought it back to the U.S. and taught it in the U.S. Uh, U.S. universities, American universities and seminaries imported theologians from Germany who believed it. And it was taught directly in U.S. seminaries and colleges in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, Machen himself went to Germany to study uh, at the end of the 19th century and was very much influenced by the liberal theologians, was almost overcome by their arguments. But in the providence of God, he was preserved from this. And he came back and he became the greatest opponent of liberalism in the United States in the 20th century. And his books, The Virgin Birth of Christ, The Origin of Paul's Religion, uh, Christianity and liberalism are all aimed at defeating liberalism. And they successfully did so. No one seriously argues today, liberal or not, that Paul's religion originated in Greek philosophy. Why? Because of the influence of Machen's book, The Origin of Paul's Religion. No one seriously argues that anymore. Uh, he was a teacher at Princeton Seminary, New Testament Greek teacher, um, and he produced a couple of major works in the early part of this century that defeated 
uh, significant ports, uh, parts of liberalism. One of them was about the origin of Paul's religion. Another was the denial of the virgin birth. And uh, those are, are, are big, thick books. You don't have to read those right away. Read his Christianity and Liberalism first. And I think you'll get a lot out of it. It's written at a more popular level um, than the other two are. Well, let's turn from Schleiermacher, and who wrote in Germany, uh, to a fellow that everyone ignored for a hundred years. Uh, Schleiermacher wrote in German, of course. Yes, sir. Um, well, I'm, I'm coming to that. Yes, in a moment. Bart was not a liberal. He was not a liberal. Um, he was influenced by Kierkegaard here. Now, Schleiermacher wrote in German, which, of course, was a, um, a widely read language uh, in the 19th century, still is today, a major nation, of course. Kierkegaard lived in Denmark and wrote in Danish. Nobody reads Danish. We eat Danish, but nobody reads Danish. So uh, nobody knew anything about Kierkegaard until fellows like Karl Barth in the, at the early part of this century called him to everyone's attention. They had read him. Karl Barth and Emil Brunner, I'll get to them in the next hour and say something about them. Uh, Kierkegaard was a very prolific writer. Uh, as you can see, he died young, 42 years old, it looks like, uh, something in that neighborhood. He was reacting against the state church in Denmark. Denmark had an established church, very formal, uh, given to ritual, of course, uh, Lutheran. Uh, they professed to believe Christianity, but it was an empty profession. And he was reacting against this formalism in the state church. What they more likely believed was the philosophy of another German philosopher named Hegel. Now, we don't have time to get into Hegel today, but Hegel was a very influential German philosopher at this time, the early part of the 19th century. And Kierkegaard is, again, reacting against to this formalism with an emotionalism, with passion. He has this in common with Schleiermacher, the emphasis on the passion, on, on the emotion. And he developed what later came to be known as uh, the theology of paradox. Uh, look at this quote at the bottom. And he had Hegel in mind uh, when he wrote it. Uh, Kierkegaard says it was intelligence and nothing else that had to be opposed. Presumably that is why I, who had the job, was armed with an immense intelligence. That gives you some flavor for his, his writing. He's ironic. He can be funny. Uh, he can be acerbic. He can be witty. Uh, but he's not systematic. He hates the system. He hates the idea that religion consists in knowledge or doctrine. Rather, faith is the highest passion. Faith is the highest passion for Kierkegaard. And he makes, some, several, he makes several illustrations which are quite uh, stunning when you read them uh, in his book. He gives this illustration, for example. He says, suppose uh, that a Lutheran who doesn't believe in Christianity uh, goes uh, to church and he prays to God he prays to the true God but he prays insincerely and then he says imagine also an idol worshiper who does not know the true God and he prays but he prays with great passion and sincerity and Kierkegaard asks on which side is there more truth the idol worshiper who prays with great passion and sincerity and actually ends up praying to God, um, or the Lutheran who is insincere, although he has the right idea of God, prays insincerely. And he presents this illustration to make his point that what's important uh, in religion is not 
having the right notion in your head, but having the right passion, having the sincerity, having the emotional commitment. That is the point he's trying to make. Now he's chosen and constructed the illustration for the purpose of making this point. You have to be careful whenever you read anyone and they use illustrations. You have to say, what's wrong with this illustration? Because all illustrations are wrong. They're inaccurate at some point. And this is no exception. And what he should have done, had he wanted to present an honest contrast, was he should, have not, he should not have said that the Lutheran was insincere. He should have said the Lutheran is, is sincere in his prayer. And then they ask the question, on which side is there more truth? And then the obvious answer would be, well, on the side of the Lutheran, praying to the true God with sincerity. The way he's constructed the illustration, the insincere Lutheran praying, uh, the answer to the question is neither side is there any truth. One is an idolater, uh, and even though he's praying with great zeal and passion, he's praying to an idol. And the other one is a hypocritical Lutheran, who became a Lutheran by being born in Denmark. That's what happens when you have a state church. You become a Lutheran by being born in a certain country. You become an Anglican, or something like that. Uh, you become a, uh, we don't have a Church of America, thank goodness, uh, but uh, there are other uh, countries where they have established churches. And you become officially a Christian by being born uh, in that country. Um, Kierkegaard uh, wrote several books Either Or is one of those I've mentioned that uh, up there he has another one called The Concluding Unscientific Postscript uh, and several more and I will, would like to read you a few more quotes from this fellow if I could um, he says that uh, Christianity is riddled with contradiction. He calls them paradoxes, but he means contradiction. Uh, God, er, Jesus Christ, is a contradiction. Jesus Christ is both God and man. That's a contradiction. How can God become man? How can God die? That's a contradiction. He says this is a religion that is riddled with paradox and contradiction. He says that's why I like it that if it made any sense that we would know that it's false the contradiction is the mark of truth in his, in his uh, thinking um, it's absurd is another way he says it uh, he says that every Christian and I think I put part of that quote up there anyway a Christian may very well have understanding he doesn't say you have to get rid of you have to empty your mind and understand nothing to be a Christian. He says a Christian may very well have understanding, and then notice the parentheses. Indeed, he must have understanding in order to believe against it. He must understand these things in order to believe against it. You have to believe both halves of a contradiction. You have to believe that God cannot die and God did die. You have to believe that God cannot become man, and God did become man. You have to believe both halves of the contradiction. <clears throat> faith is against reason, to put it another way. Uh, faith is against logic. Uh, objective truth does not exist. Uh, what is important is subjective truth. If it's true for you, that's what's important. Uh, he distinguished, as I put up there somewhere between two kinds of truth, it truth and thou truth. Now perhaps some of you have heard the name Martin Buber, B-U-B-E-R. He's another German 20th century theologian and philosopher who picked up on this distinction that Kierkegaard made between two kinds of truth. What's it truth? Well, it truth is proposition. The cat is black. That's an example of it truth. What's thou truth? Well, we're not quite sure what thou truth is. It's personal truth. It's encounter. When you become a Christian, 
Uh, you don't become a Christian by believing certain statements about Christ. Uh, it's not a matter of reading 1 Corinthians 15 and believing what Paul says there. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. No. That's it truth. You can do away with that. Thou truth is actually meeting Christ. You have an encounter with Christ. You have an experience with Christ. You have a personal experience, a personal relationship with Christ. That's what thou truth is. And unless you have this experience and this relationship, you're not a Christian. If you simply believe what the Bible says, you're going to go to hell. Now, both of these men develop uh, an idea that wasn't, the, again, it wasn't original with them. Both Schleiermacher and Kierkegaard press the distinction between the head and the heart. Hit truth is a matter of the head. Thou truth is a matter of the heart. And again, this is very common in 20th century churches. When I grew up, I grew up in a uh, free Methodist church. And I remember being hearing from the pulpit, uh, from the minister, that some people were going to miss heaven by 12 inches. Uh, this is a quote. I'm not making this up. In fact, there's a tract. I've seen a tract somebody wrote up about this. Um, you're going to miss heaven by 12 inches because you believe it with your head, but you don't believe it with your heart. And this goes straight back to Kierkegaard and Schleiermacher. The heart in their theology is the center of the emotion. And that's what's important, the feelings, the emotions. Now, if you do a word study, get out of concordance and look up the word heart. Get out your strongs or your youngs and look up the word heart and trace it through the Bible. You'll find several hundred instances of it in the Bible. And you'll find out that this is not what the Bible means when it talks about heart. It's not talking about emotion. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Well, if, you're, uh, if, if heart means emotions, you can't think in your heart. You can think in your head, you can think in your mind, but not in your heart. The word heart in the Bible does not mean what modern theologians say it means. And do the word study yourself. Get out your concordance and look it up. Um, all of these intellectual things uh, are not part of Christianity for either Kierkegaard uh, or Schleiermacher. Um, what is important is believing contradictions. What is important is having the right feelings, having the right passion. Uh, Kierkegaard gives another illustration, and he uses Abraham in this case. He actually turns to Scripture, and he uses Abraham. And he says, think of Abraham. God comes to Abraham. He's already given him the promise that his son will be the the salvation of the world. Abraham's son. Through his son will come the salvation of the world. And then years later, God comes to Abraham and says, kill your son. Sacrifice your son. And this is a paradox, according to Kierkegaard. God says, through your son will come the salvation of the world, the Savior. And then he says, kill your son. Offer him as a sacrifice. And he argues that Abraham believed both of these and lived with the contradiction. In fact, his faith is illustrated in the fact uh, that he believed both of these halves of the contradiction, this conflict. The only problem with this uh, understanding of the account of Abraham is that the New Testament tells us something else. Does anybody know, does anybody recall what we're told about Abraham? In the book of Hebrews, uh, when God tells him to sacrifice his son, what does Abraham do? Well, he does it by faith, but why? What, what does he think? We're told explicitly that he comes to a certain conclusion. I'm sorry? Precisely. Abraham understands that when he kills Isaac, or if he kills Isaac, God will raise him from the dead. There's no contradiction. 
Abraham has reasoned through to the solution to this problem. He has used his intelligence, which Kierkegaard opposes, to reason through to the solution. I've, God has given a promise that through Isaac will come the Savior, and now God has commanded me to sacrifice Isaac, to kill Isaac. How can this be? Do we just accept this as a contradiction? No. Abraham says he reasoned, the book of Hebrews says that Abraham reasoned that God could raise him from the dead. And he did not hesitate to obey God and go out and begin to sacrifice uh, Isaac. Of course, uh, Kierkegaard and Schleiermacher as well oppose any kind of system in the Bible, any kind of systematic thinking at all, uh, what they do is they create a sort of attitude that is anti-philosophy, anti-theology, anti-system. And again, this is what uh, characterizes theology in the 20th century. It's anti-system. And uh, in the 20th century, which we'll get to in the next hour, uh, some major schools of thought pick up on his emphasis on paradox and contradiction and say, yes, this is the mark of truth. And that's why we believe Christianity is true. Now, don't get Kierkegaard confused with Tertullian. And some people will quote Tertullian as saying, I believe because it's absurd. I believe because it's absurd. Uh, he was not saying the same thing that Kierkegaard was saying at all. Uh, absurd for Tertullian meant that... Uh, it was absurd or foolishness to the Greek mind. We're told that the gospel is foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews. And Tertullian was saying, I believe because it's foolishness to the Greek mind. But he was not asserting, lo asserting logical contradictions in the Bible itself, as Kierkegaard did. Kierkegaard said there's no solution to these problems. And you don't attempt the solution to these problems. You have to believe both halves of the contradiction. Of course, it's psychologically impossible to believe them. Um, if you, if I told you that uh, vinegar cures warts, uh, some people believe that vinegar cures warts, uh, and if I told you that vinegar does not cure warts, and I told you you have to believe both of those things, of course, you couldn't do it. You can believe one or the other, but you cannot believe that both that vinegar cures warts and vinegar does not cure warts. You have to choose. And because it's absurd. The light that lights your mind, the logos that lights your mind, makes it impossible for you to believe a contradiction, knowing it to be a contradiction. Many people believe contradictory things, but they don't realize they're contradictory. Once they realize that those things are contradictory, then they can't believe them. And if I make it as a simple a statement as that, uh, vinegar cures warts and vinegar doesn't cure warts, you can see the contradiction immediately. You can believe one or the other, but not both. You seem to understand that you read the Bible very well. It seems like it's not very smart. Oh! No, he's very smart, very intelligent. Uh, you know, it's boasting, I guess, in the last paragraph here. But, but, but no one denies that he had uh, an immense intelligence. <laughs> yes. Um, one, would, one would have thought, perhaps, that he did believe in it, but he said it's irrelevant. He said... Um, what you need when he talked about when he talked about salvation, you need an encounter with Christ. You don't need to know historical facts; they're irrelevant. And the Bible, when it recites historical facts like about the birth and the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Christ, has nothing to do with true religion. What you need is an encounter, a relationship, an experience with the living Christ, and you get that through your subjective faith, your subjective emotions. You get that through your subjective feelings. You don't get that by reading a book. 
he's a, he was a great opponent of reading books. Wrote a lot of books, but a uh, great opponent of reading books. You know, you wish sometimes that these guys would practice what they preach. <laughs> and if books are so bad, don't write any. You know, we'd be, we'd be much better off if they didn't do it. Um, but no, he did not respect Scripture at all in that way. Schleiermacher, no. No respect for Scripture. And yet, as far as Scripture talks about history, it's subject to being, in Schleiermacher's case especially, it's subject to being undermined by further historical research. So what we want to do is make true religion immune from historical research. We get it out of the realm of history, out of the realm of facts, into the realm of feelings. And then it's protected against further research. That was their way that they hoped to defend true religion. Of course, it ends true religion. It undermines true religion. Yes, sir. historical statements in the Bible started to, even before these gentlemen with, a, with the uh, philosopher Spinoza and that had continued from Spinoza's time uh, up through the 19th century and uh, they were concerned I don't know if, uh, if there was anything specific in mind but uh, uh, they were concerned that yeah, if, if we left Christianity in that realm further research even though it may not to this date have undermined Christianity further research in time would do so. And the Kierkegaard in particular emphasized that we cannot rest our eternal salvation on some historical accident. We have to have a more solid ground than that. And the solid ground he found in this passion, this religious passion, this religious feeling uh, that people have. That's that's a more solid ground because it's immune from attacks from the historians. Yes, ma'am. about Kierkegaard or uh, Schleiermacher. They're mouthfuls, but they're, they are the fathers of modern theology. And in the next hour, when I talk about some of the uh, people in the 20th century, we'll be able to see how uh, they are, they've been so influential in this century. They, they turned religion, uh, they undermined Christianity altogether and turned religion into something of the emotions something having to do with the emotions, the experiences, and the feelings. Completely different in many ways from anything that has come before. Certainly Luther and Calvin didn't do this. Thomas Aquinas did not do this. Um,